first uh, uh, lecture after lunch is a keynote, and uh, I guess we're uh, we, we uh, got some benefits from the North American Catalysis Society, and that is that uh, Stu Soet has recently received the uh, Seattle lectureship, and uh, we're fortunate that he was able to come up here to Saskatoon to join us and give the keynote this afternoon. Uh, Stu's from uh, Exxon, Exxon Mobil, right now. And uh, the title of his talk, Recent Advances in the Synthesis of Catalytic Materials. Thank you. Thank you. It's actually my pleasure to be here uh, this meeting. to this meeting. There were a lot of talks already I've heard that were very interesting and that I was very interested in myself. So it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life at uh, ExxonMobil for more than 25 years now. You know, being there for that long a time, we get an opportunity to work on many different things. But what's most dear to my heart and is kind of the, my home, sort of my spirit, what my life has been, has been working mostly on catalytic materials getting started on that, uh, and that leading into many other things. So um, that's what I'm going to focus this presentation on today. Uh, so when you, when you think about working on catalytic materials, I like to think that these materials are kind of like, working with them is kind of like raising kids. And why is that? Because getting, the goal is to get them behave, to behave in ways that they don't really want to behave, and then have them stay there that way. So, this is the way you know thermodynamic state of kids usually is. This is the way you'd like them to be. And even if you can get them to be that way, eventually they go that way. So it's exactly what happens with catalysts. They, um, you need to trick them. And, and in other words, the, most of the, the catalytic materials of interest are ones where we, we get them in metastable states. And that's kind of going to be the theme of the talk that I'm going to uh, present to you there. I'm going to try to give you several examples of actual real situations where metastability has been uh, the goal of what we've been trying to do and what we've learned from those studies. And in one case, in the end, I'll actually tell you about um, sort of the very beginning uh, work that actually led into the nebula catalyst, which was essentially an illustration of this. Okay, so how do we go about and create metastable states? Well, this is our normal toolkit. It's a periodic table. Many times we wish it was a little bit larger a little bit wider, a little bit deeper, but that's what we have. And we basically have to mix these things in various ways, making powders, oftentimes, mostly, and then eventually getting them into some sort of form that we can use. And there's all kinds of issues, materials issues, along the way here. Okay, so the three, the three uh, approaches and the three themes that I'm gonna get into, well, I'm probably gonna just get to talk about the first two, is one, how to control the morphology. And that means specifically how to work on getting the sites placed in the appropriate environments. And that could be on several length scales, and it could be nanoscale. And for that one, I'm going to give you an example of a hydrogenation reaction involving ruthenium catalyst. I'm going to then talk about some things that are more on, say, a micron scale. That's going to come out of work on solid acids. Uh, issues about getting things placed on millimeter scale. And that'll come out of an example from Fischer-Tropsch catalysis. And then I'll get on to the second point here, which is actually how to access metastable precursors by non-classical synthesis. <coughs> that will essentially lead into you know, a, bit of a, a little bit of a discussion, and at least the very beginnings of how Nebula actually grew. This is actually a true story. You're going to find kind of interesting and hope. Okay, and this we're probably not going to have time unless nobody shows up after me. Okay, um, so the first subject I'm going to talk about is a hydrogenation reaction. This was a phthalate hydrogenation that part of our chemicals company was in and it involved trying to use ruthenium supported ruthenium catalysts, obviously trying to maximize the activity. It was well known in the art that you wanted the catalyst on a non-acidic support. And so when we, when we got started in this, it just basically as a background, one of the, the, the classical ways of preparing supported metals are, are, are many fold. One of the simplest ways is just to do incipient wetness impregnation and evaporation. The problem with that is that it's dominated by physical forces. 
by the evaporation of the solution, the supersaturation as its evaporation occurs. And consequently, these type of preparations are oftentimes difficult to control and reproduce. People have worked with trying to use electrostatic interactions, that is matching the charge of the impregnated species with the charge on the surface, oftentimes measuring that by techniques such as say the potential measurements, determining the isoelectric point of the support, and trying to match the impregnate with that. Another way is to try to actually form some complexes by using organic additives. And where the thing I'm going to talk about is really down that axis. There's a little bit of a twist on it that, that I'll show you. Other issues that are important is sometimes the actual decomposition of the precursor turns out to be important, particularly if you have gas evolution of NOx, water, and so on. That can have a lot of influence on the way that the metal winds up because of mobility issues. Now, ruthenium has some special properties. And what are those? Well, ruthenium oxides can be extremely mobile, especially on silica surfaces. And we were going to be working on silica here, trying to, to, to work with a, essentially a neutral support. OK, the other issue with ruthenium that actually turns out to be an advantage is that it has a very strong hydrogenolysis <coughs> activity. We're going to take advantage of both of those. And what I'm going to try to show you is that in this approach, what we've been able to do is to produce highly dispersed, not only dispersed, but this, this sort of factor on supported metal catalyst, which many times I don't believe is very well appreciated, but we find that it, we've had many situations where this actually turns out to be quite important, that not only do you want to disperse the small, but you want them homogeneously distributed on a nanoscale on that support. You don't want clusters, you want them nicely distributed. And we're going to have some examples of how you can have catalysts that at least look the same in some ways, but because the nanoscale is different, they behave very differently. So we're going to do that by forming in situ some, uh, uh, and I'll use the term loosely, some supported interacting or down metallic precursors, which were formed using bifunctional dispersion aids. Well, it's, a, it's a kind of a wordy sentence, but I'll show you. It's actually a very simple uh, concept. We, we're taking it, and the reason we got to work on this was the idea became a lot of the organics that people use in impregnations are monofunctional. They have carboxylate groups, they have hydroxyl groups. So we started to work with bifunctional dispersion aids, things that would have an, an NH2 group and either an OH or a COH group. So this is one, and this is the one that I'm going to be talking about today, triethanol of me. And simply, well now if you take ruthenium, you take ruthenium salt like nitrate and nitrocyl nitrate, you put it into just aqueous impregnation and add some of this triethanol of me, and you look at the decomposition of that on silica, you find that it's actually a very eventful process. A lot of things are happening when you just air oxidize it. So here's the, here's the weight change in blue, and very uh, interesting, the DTA curve. So we have several exothermic events going on here at lower temperatures, and there's a broader one here. And then there's a very, very sharp one as we go out to higher temperatures. So this is going through a multiple step of decomposition, including some particular complex that's getting formed here as you go through these partial decompositions at a stable at high temperatures. So what we did was take this and actually heat the temperatures here between maybe 275 and 300 C to go through the first set, set of exothermic steps, but maintain what we have over here. Okay, so this shows now, if you do that, you heat this at 300 degrees C, and then if you were to come back and do it again, you see all the stuff in the beginning is gone. And then you do have this very stable complex that's left of the partial decomposition of the triethanolamine ruthenium complex that's been that you impregnated with. And what we'll find and what I'm going to show you is that this actually forms a very strongly interacting complex with the silica. Because it interacts strongly with the silica, it tends to disperse it very nicely. And, and it avoids now going through the ruthenium oxide precursor. Don't oxidize this fully. You keep that organic complex there. Okay, and we're going to see that that's important. Now, one of the signs of this is if you actually look at the hydrogen reduction profile of this particular complex, and if you were to look at if you just neat ruthenium oxide on silica, you can get that to reduce at 150 degrees C, and I'll show you some evidence of that in a moment. So that very easy to reduce. This reduction occurs at temperatures above 300 degrees C. It really kicks in at temperatures even above 350 C. Okay? And that's a consequence of this complex interacting so strongly with the silica. So this slide shows some chemistry absorption data. This is kind of the key, one of the key things of what, we're, uh, what we saw here. So I'm going to just show you what that was. If you go ahead and just do something simple, take ruthenium nitrate and just impregnate it on silica aqueously, careful not to calcine it so you don't go to the oxide, you just have the nitrate there and directly reduce that. 
you get something with a with a high dispersion. And what I'm what I'm really plotting here with dispersion is the hydrogen over ruthenium ratio, the H over R U. We found for ruthenium that actually the single isotherm more closely correlates with the actual sizes that you measure on, on, on by TEM. So unlike platinum, where you have all kinds of issues and you have to do dual isotherms, with ruthenium with single isotherm uh, gives you much data that much more closely resembles TEM. So actually, you get about 80% dispersed, very small particles. But what happens now is you do these reductions at subsequently higher temperatures, the ruthenium dispersion goes down. Okay, something's happening, we're losing metal sites as we're going up in temperature. It's not stable. If we take that calcine complex, that's these blue circles here. Remember, I just showed you on the last slide, you have to go to high temperatures to reduce it. So at the low temperatures, nothing. Once you get above over here and you're up to 400 degrees C, you also get a very high dispersion. But notice that when we hold this, uh, when we go ahead and further reduce this for three, hour, for three hours further, I measured chemistry option, and then another three hours measured chemistry option, the values stay very stable. They don't go down in fact, even below over there. Okay? So, whereas you can say, well, I have an 80% dispersed catalyst here, I have an 80% dispersed catalyst here, they're not the same things. Okay? Something different has happened. And that's what I was referring to in the beginning. It's, a, it's an issue about site placement on a nanoscale structure. The, the corresponding samples that are much worse if you actually take this aqueous one and calcine it, so you get to ruthenium oxide, and then you go ahead and just reduce it at 400, or uh, actually calcine at 300, and then reduce it at 400, you can barely measure anything. If you take this complex and calcine the complex away, it's obviously much lower than over here, but you do get a non-zero value, and that's also a reflection of what I'm going to show you of what's going on here. The okay, main thing is we've got reductive sintering, uh, resistance to reductive sintering when we go through this complex. So in order to understand that, we looked at some TEM, uh, and here we were able to uh, see some significant difference. What we're, what we're measuring, what we're seeing here, uh, individual particles of ruthenium, about 12 to 15 angstroms in diameter, and they're well spaced from each other. You can contrast that with the one where we just do the aqueous impregnation. Okay? And hopefully you can see this. This is the one that's reduced to 150. So we've got it to reduce at low temperatures. And if you can see here, there are small ruthenium crystallites uh, located in these circles, but they're highly clustered in, in regions that we like to, to, to call little graveyards. And so when you go ahead and you actually take these same areas and reduce them at 400 C, you actually can see the much larger particles where those little graveyards are now, the particles have clustered into much larger ruthenium. So this nanoscale distribution has created a significant difference between the two materials. And just to summarize uh, pictorially, this is what happens. Aqueous, you do get small crystallites if you reduce it directly at 150. <coughs> but if you go to 400, some of these things that are close together will reductively sinter. If you oxidize to 300, well, they just become very, very big. And although they reduce at low temperatures, you get very, very large clumps of ruthenium. Okay, if you go through this complex, and this is just uh, another one of my artistic renditions, but the belief that we have here, and really what we, we, we started to work with these, is that we thought that maybe the amino groups could complex with some of the metals, and leaving the, either hydroxyls or carboxylates at the, at the other end of the organic to, to sort of uh, condense with the hydroxyls on the surface, that we might be able to get a different type of control than we were. So we've gotten these complexes, you know, this partially decomposed complex, to, to interact strongly. So when we reduce it directly, we get that. If we oxidize it, well, they grow, but they're still well separated from each other. And so when you, when you reduce these, you will get something that much larger than over here because you have gone through an oxide, and the oxide has, 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 um, does have some mobility, but it's much better than what we get up here. So that's the reason why you see that. And we went ahead and, and uh, looked at some of these. Uh, so here's a variety of different ruthenium oxalica catalysts. This was the reaction we were interested in. It's this hydrogenation of the phthalate, hydrogenating the aromatic ring without bothering the ester functionality. And you can see all of these are a half percent uh, ruthenium, yeah, a half percent ruthenium on silica. And so we're getting a rate which is proportional to the percent of dispersion. So being at the same loading level, on all of these, we're essentially measuring the rate versus the number of ruthenium on the catalyst surface. And so we have a very nice correlation here. That doesn't always happen. There's no acid site or anything else from, you know, that's getting in the way of, of the metal catalysis. So that's dominating, and the catalyst made 
with the reducing this complex behave very well. In fact, it's extremely good for this, for this reaction. So what, what, what is this complex? I'll just try to spend a few minutes, um, we have time for the rest of the stuff, uh, to talk about this. So we did a little bit of characterization. You go back and look at the TGA and now uh, look at the TG mass spec analysis. And what you see, this three traces of water that's coming off is heating up. The CO2 is these, this blue and yellow line. And you can see at that low temperature where we had those exotherms, we are losing some carbon. There is an oxidation going on there. The nitrogen, on the other hand, this is in this red one, and it's a, you know, it's a much smaller signal. That is staying intact until we get to this very high temperature. So that's one thing we learned. These nitrogen, carbon nitrogen oxygen complexes on metals are extremely oxidatively stable and will last. So this, this is the beast. When we actually do a, a uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen analysis after it's been heated at that temperature to create the complex, you know, we see something which is enriched with nitrogen relative to carbon and hydrogen when we started out. So it all hangs together that we have actually made a, a more nitrogen-rich complex than what we started with. Infrared is shown, actually, we think that this is part of the, the critical component that we have actually made a um, nitrile type species that's complex to the ruthenium, and we see peaks for that as well as some peaks for the CO, uh, and that occurs after the impregnate is calcined. So we think that that is an indication that that nitrile species is what's actually coordinated with the ruthenium. We looked at the Raman, and you can see the nice peaks that you get for the calcined version where you have large RUO2, those are just not there on the, on the complex. Same thing on the XS results. Uh, these were done, this, this work was done by Paul Stevens. And uh, here we can clearly see ruthenium, ruthenium distances when you, when you have a thing calcined and you have large pieces of ruthenium. When you have the complex, it's really washed out. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. We made an organooxal complex uh, by partially decomposing these bifunctional PEA impregnates. It strongly interacts with silica avoids the formation of mobile ruthenium oxide, stable towards reductive sintering, looks like nitrile species, and behaves very well It's an oxidation catalyst. When I've gone back and looked at actually some of the work, unfortunately I didn't, I didn't know Frank Ciappetta. My colleague and, and good friend uh, John Sinfeld actually has told me some stories of the early Gordon conferences when he was there and, and spoke with Frank. And uh, John impressed upon me how much Frank really loved sort of industrial type research. So when I went back and looked at some of the work he did, it's kind of interesting because some of the themes that we work on today, that's what people were interested in. It's the only problem was it was back you know, more than 50, 50 years ago. So here's one where they were hydrogenating aromatic hydrocarbons to alkyl alpha cycle paraffins. So a hydrogenation reaction. Same as what we're doing now, maybe a little different in the chemistry, but same type of things. So, okay, I'm going to go on to the next piece now. I, I want to talk about uh, an example out of solid acids. And this also is trying to get things located at appropriate spots. This is working now, going to, to look at large particles. So let me show you how we got into this one. This is a, another artistic rendition that I like to use of, of uh, solid acidity scale. Okay, if you go along the top axis here, I like to look at that as basically just where the oxides are and what we have available. So we start out with silica, non acidic aluminum, a little bit of acidity. People then try to get to uh, a little bit increased acidity from that by adding halides. So I'm actually using that as halide axis here. And you have chloride and fluoride aluminum. And those of you may be very familiar, this is usually done in places where you have bifunctional reactions with metal and sort of these intermediate strain acids. We're actually doing conversions on the olefins. Then you can go back up to the, the oxide line. You have the more facility alumina. You get into the zeolites. And then I can see, and, and there's two dotted areas here, one here, one here, we always looked at that as opportunity areas with solid acids. If we could somehow get off of, of, the, of, of these axes down here, either the halides or the, some of these noxious liquid acids, it would be nice. And there's been some efforts over the years uh, in terms of on the strong side of the scale, this is where a lot of the work on the zirconia based materials, so tungstated and sulfated zirconia, but also heteropoly compounds. And that's what I'm going to be looking at now. This actually came from a problem, also another one from our, uh, our chemicals group from, from several years ago, where they were trying to alkylate um, a, a, a polymeric olefin with phenol, and they were making some additive that way. Uh, one of the options that they had was using boron trifluoride monohydrate, 
boron trifluoride monohydrate, they have to make by taking boron trifluoride gas and the dihydrate. The dihydrate is not too bad. The, the, the gas is like fatal in PPV doses. So uh, in, in, in some meetings we had, you know, we sort of suggested maybe we could use a, a particular solid acid for this. So we were at that time we were working a lot with the with the uh, heteropoly acids. Now these these acids have been studied a lot in the literature, uh, primarily. Uh, Professor Mazzona in Japan did a lot of work. Professor Moffitt, who is not far from here, uh, worked, worked, I think, most of his career on these, and they did beautiful work and sort of opened up the area for those of us that might want to try to see how to apply that. So these kind of materials, and I'm showing a cake and polyanide, and the one that's most frequently used is this 12 tungsto phosphoric acid, which is really a PW12043 minus anion, about 10 angstroms in diameter, and that's separated by cations of H5O2 plus. Okay. And those, there's, a, there's a, obviously an acidic proton here, very exchangeable, quite acidic, and, and works very well for some reactions. So we tried this material, you can buy this material, it's water soluble, it's easy to work with. So we tried this material in the reaction and it worked very well. The only problem was, because this is soluble in water, because we had phenol in there, and this was being done at high temperatures, there was plenty of solubility of this in the phenol. So that was not very good. Really don't want any of the tungsten in your additive. Um, so what to do? Um, we, we started to look at a, uh, the area of the heteropoly compounds where you do an exchange of these protons with larger cations. You can do it with ammonium. You can do it with cesium. Uh, and in fact, that also had been reported. And what happens when you do that is you actually start to precipitate some of these materials. Um, they form without any waters of hydration. They're insoluble, they precipitate, and they, they are very small, though. They're, and I like to really think of them as sub-micron-sized Bronsted acids. Because the interesting thing about these materials, as opposed to zeolites, is that you can replace 70 or 80 percent, or even more, of the protons here with sort of a basic cesium. Yet there's enough shielding from these anions that the few protons that are left still have a lot of acidity associated with them. If you do the same thing for zeolite, and you put that much cesium in there, the zeolite is, is done. Okay. So the problem was this. We, we made this, this very fine powder. It's even impossible to filter. You kind of have to decant the liquid and evaporate it. The problem was, and we had a very good reaction, very good result. They were very happy. They said, OK, we'd like to run this now as a pilot test and see what to do. But we're going to be running this in a, in a big column with all this liquid. So we need some particles of, of millimeter size. So we're going to, OK, well, you know, of course, you'd like to impregnate it. The problem is this is insoluble. So what to do, and especially when they said that they, they needed this material uh, you know, for two weeks, uh, and they needed a couple of uh, 100 grams. So I had a little bit of a headache. I went back to my office and, uh, and I said, well, maybe we can figure out some way of going through an extrusion, but it's, it's not going to be simple. Is there something else we can do to try to, to do this? And the, the bottom line was, Yes, it turned out that there was. You can actually prepare these in, uh, in an in-situ way. In, in almost, a, I don't want to say ship in the bottle, but in a, in a very simple way, you can wind up with a very interesting morphology. And this is the morphology that we wound up with. These are silica extrudates about a 16th inch in diameter across. Okay, So you snap the extrudate, this is after you made it, and you do backscattered imaging on this. And when you see this white ring is where you see the tungsten. And when you look for cesium, you see it in the same spot. So you have actually made the phase, and I'll show you in a second uh, proof of that, right inside in this very interesting egg white configuration, about two thirds of the way into the, into the particle. These are just different views, a little more magnified view, another magnified view. You can see how sharp it is. There's a little bit of spillage off of it, but it's amazingly sharp. And we had a really high loading of, of the material at that point. So how did that, how did that happen? Let me first show you a, a little bit of, of evidence that that is what happened. This is the, an X-ray diffraction of the, of the phosphor tungsten gas. It's a nice cubic pattern. If you just precipitate and make the bulk cesium one, you see two things. One, the piece is shifted to higher temperature. The unit cell is contracted because the cesium is smaller than the H5O2 plus, and they grow up because the particles are so small. This is what we get when we take those extrudates and grind them up. You see exactly the same. So both the EDS and the X-ray confirmed it. 
So this is exact, this is this is in fact what happened. We have a silica surface, at high pH, what we first did was impregnate with the cesium, cesium carbonate. Now when you do that, you get an exchange. The proton is exchanged with the cesium when you do this at high pH. So you wind up decorating the surface in a very even mode all throughout the extrudate with something that looked like this. The carbon dioxide goes away as this, and you basically had the surface set up. Now when you come in with the phospho tungstic acid, you're doing this at low pH now, the reverse exchange happens. As this starts to impregnate through the outside of the extrudate, you start getting some exchange of the cesium into the PW, into this uh, H3 salt. So this becomes H3 minus X, cesium X. As you go further in, X increases, you get more and more cesium rich until you reach a critical concentration where that now becomes insoluble. And it's like a chromatographic de deposition that occurs as you reach that critical point and make something of about that, 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 that stoichiometry that forms here. And that's how we got to this, uh, actually, should be egg white distribution of precipitated acid salt. So you have a very complicated structure and a very interesting way of putting it into a pellet, but actually very simple. All it is is two impregnations. So it's a way of trying to control things, uh, very complicated things, in a very simple way. OK, um, acid catalysis that uh, Frank Sinkhead was interested in. Here's some, some work with the production of isopurely, also using a, 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 a liberalization reaction. Okay, we'll go on to number three now. We're going to have to speed up a little bit. Actually, we have 10 minutes, right? There's my chair. Yeah, you've got have about 12. I'm going to skip this section because we just don't have enough time because I think more of you are going to be interested in the, uh, in the last part. So let me go on now to this part, which is the accessing metastable precursors by non-classical synthesis and how that led into nebula. And you know, many of you have heard nebula. I'll tell you a little bit more about it here, just a little bit, and um, show you show you how we got there. It actually, it's kind of an interesting story because it came out of having a summer student present back in 1993. We weren't working in hydro treating at that time. And I heard some discussion here at the meeting about how industry doesn't like to support sort of discovery efforts. Well, this was one that paid back. And because at that point in time, we were interested in looking at, at some chemistry with hydrocalcides. There were a couple of papers and a poster or two here on that. Just for those of you that are not that familiar with it, hydrocalcides are kind of anionic clays. Um, they're, they're layers. Um, of them is layers of brucite and magnesium hydroxide into which some aluminum has been substituted. Because of that, it creates a positive charge in the layer, the aluminum being plus three, replacing the plus two magnesium. And you wind up with carbonate and some water in between these interlayers as a way of neutralizing the positive charge on, on the surface. Okay, so that's a nice material. At that point in time, most of the work that was done on that was actually directed towards base catalysis. There have been some reports in the literature about using these as kind of high surface area magnesium oxides. And so that was, at that time we were working a lot with solid acids and we were trying to do some exploration studies on solid bases. But in the process of that summer, we came across some interesting work that we decided to follow up on and, and uh, it turned out to be uh, related to, well, sort of got us pushed in a different direction. That is, there was a report at that point in time, it was a relatively recent report by a, a researcher at, um, was at Alamo at that time. And he found that if he did this precipitation of the magnesium and the aluminum in a, in a base, but excluded carbonate, excluded CO2, and had terephthalic acid in there, he could get terephthalate incorporated here. And this would separate the layers and make a much larger distance than about five or six nanometers you get here. And then he could come back with an anion exchange with a polyoxalolibdate and get that incorporated. And that was all we had seen with hydrocalcides and getting molybdenum incorporated into them. Okay, so that was like that was kind of like the the, uh, the background. So in the course of the work of that summer, we found one interesting thing that really took us off. We wound up actually working with the zinc aluminum instead of magnesium, the zinc aluminum hydrocalcide. And here's an indication of what happens when you do some some uh, heating with this. If you take the zinc aluminum hydrocalcide and calcine at 500 degrees, what happens? The carbonate leaves. A lot of this water leaves. You wind up just making an oxide. You make a very broad-looking oxide. It looks like zinc oxide with a little bit of aluminum substituted into it. 
the interesting part, and, it, and this was, we took a, a solution, it's simply a solution of ammonium molybdate, and put it into a suspension of this oxide at, at 50 degrees C and let it sit there for about an hour. Well, we took that solid that came out now, we wound up with something that looked like this. It had changed. Now, you might look at this top pattern and the bottom pattern, but well, there is some relationship there, perhaps, but it is clearly different than what we went in. So this was fascinating at the point for that point time to us, and looked like there is, in fact, this what we call reduce reaction, a, a, a low temperature, soft chemical reaction that was going on in converting these hydrocalcides to something which looked like it might have had the associated with it. Okay, as we explored further, we later found out that this structure you can make not only with the uh, direct solution reaction, uh, the, the reaction from the hydrocalcide, but you can actually make it from a direct solution reaction. And not only could you do it with zinc, could you do it with magnesium, you could also do it with nickel. Okay, so here we had something with nickel, here we had something with moly, here we had a new structure. Okay, working where I had already worked for 15 years at that time in the company, having something interesting and different, <coughs> nickel and moly sort of raised our attention. Uh, and the fact that we were seeing some low temperature chemistry and things going on in sort of this metastable region sort of raised the flag in our mind. So you can see here, for example, this is the Sumi douche product that I showed you on the last slide. And this now is if you just take nickel, molybdenum, add some ammonium hydroxide, dissolve everything, boil it up, dry the ammonia off, you get essentially the same phase. Okay. The zinc you can do by, by Sumi douche, the uh, nickel and the magnesium uh, you have to do by this direct precipitation. There's a reason for that one. I'll talk to you later if you want to, want, to, want to hear more about it. Okay, so what did we have? We went and we fit that unit cell, and first if we compare what we're going to get with that hydrocalcite, see hydrocalcite is hexagonal, it's got about a 3 by 20, almost 23 extra unit cell. The Shubidush, kind of interesting, the pattern looks somewhat the same. The A axis had essentially doubled. The C axis was smaller, so we went, wow. I can understand the doubling, there might be some, some supercell being formed in here. But how did this thing ever shrink? We went from carbonate to molybdate. Molybdate is a lot larger than carbonate. So that was a very interesting puzzle at the time. And one of the first pieces of evidence we had is a Raman on that and found out that the molybdate was actually isolated tetrahedral. So it was very different than what Dresden reported, where we had the polyoxide molybdate. Okay. Finally, it took some time, but we managed to actually solve this crystal structure with this powder and found the following. Okay, we get a structure that is related to hydrocalcite, but substantially different. And this kind of explained everything. These layers that we're having over here contain the nickel. And if this were hydrocalcite, these edge shared layers would just be filled with more nickel. And if there was aluminum there, there would be aluminum in there, octahedra. Well, what we're finding here is that if we go along, say, the A direction in this way, that every other row kind of has a vacancy in there. And above and below the plane of those nickel atoms, we have a tetrahedra of molybdenum, an isolated tetrahedra. Okay, so now that unit cell is doubling because we're going two, unit, two, two rows over before we get the translational periodicity. And it's shrinking along the C direction, which is out here, because now we've got this actually bonded to the sheet it's not sitting there in this van der Waals space like the carbonate was. So that, again, now that raised the thought, okay, we can do this with nickel and moly. We have the nickel and the moly now placed in this atomic proximity to each other, and this might be something interesting for us to look at. And in fact, that's, that's essentially really what got us into nebula. Now, th th this was really step one. There's about another five or six steps, which I can't talk about if I expect to go home with all of my pens just still intact. But, through uh, you know, a lot more work, lab work, uh, um, over many years. Um, and then following a collaboration that we had and an alliance that we had with the group in Amsterdam, which was Axel Nobel, uh, now it was Albert Raleigh, some of you might know the people, in the, some of the people in the picture. We, we actually, several years ago, came out with uh, a material, extrude um, of, of a bulk catalyst that has been uh, extremely interesting for certain particular applications. I'll show you a little bit about those. And that's known as Nebula, the version of Nebula that came out was Nebula 20. Here's, a, here's an example in, in hydro treating, uh, hydro cracking pretreatment using an LCCO, uh, light cast cycle oil feed. 
this is kind of, it's a little bit of a marketing picture, but it is in fact what happened. These are a bunch of the supported catalysts that, that Albemarle or Axo had, had done. This is their so-called STARS catalyst, which had a nice improvement of where they were before that. And here's where Nebula was. So we're getting about a factor of two improvement in volumetric activity with this catalyst for hydrocracking pretreatment. And it has been used in several refineries before this. And you can see here, it's a pilot plant uh, case comparing a, a base nickel moly supported catalyst versus just a, a, a stack bed using a partial charge of nebula. And here you can get the nitrogen in the hydrocracking pretreatment. You try and get the nitrogen down before you see the ZY catalyst. And you see how effectively you can do it and how stable it is. Uh, so this was a way, actually, in this particular situation, we were able to get to, to twice the relative volume activity, even a partial fill. And uh, some of these have exceeded already two years' uh, time on stream. So there were applications in hydrocracking pretreat, particularly for LCCO. Uh, there's this whole issue that we've been hearing about all week about low sulfur diesel. This is some of the specs in Europe. Um, we've heard some of this chemistry about trying to hydrogenate some of these hindered uh, DBT molecules. And in fact, that is what Nebula was so good at. It's extremely effective hydrogenation catalyst in the presence of sulfur. So it goes through this route at faster rate than some of the supported catalysts. And you can see here, here's a case of a uh, distillate HDS, medium pressure. I think this one was at 500 pounds. Um, I think it's a straight run gas oil. This is an engineering unit of essentially getting to the same conversion, looking what the temperature difference is. And you can see temperature differences of about 20 degrees cooler. You can get to the same conversion with nebula. OK, so Frank also was interested in HDS. Here they're using platinum on aluminum. This goes back to 1953. And so I mean, it's, it's, again, interesting to me that this work continues on and on. So the nebula story continues. It's been incorporated now in about more than a dozen commercial units um, where there are still opportunities with slightly heavier feeds, VGOs and so on. And with some luck, we're hoping this summer to have the first uh, sort of commercial trial of what will be on Nebula 30 product, which will work better, at least it has up to this point, in all the work that we've done with heavier feeds. So, so let me go to the very end now. Okay, some of the thanks here. I think the person that I, I owe almost all of this to and sort of the, the sort of love that I had for this area was goes back to the days when I was in Brown in the 1970s. I was Professor Wall and had a solid state chemistry lab back then. It's just a, a great role model. Um, mentors at Exxon Mobil, people, probably two people that many of you know, Gary McVicker and Ricky Iglesia, from whom I learned so much um, about calcis um, over the years. Who are uh, very good friends? Two gentlemen that have worked with me for many years. Some of the people that were involved in the early work on Nebula. Some of the people from Albemarle that were um, also continue to work on it. Uh, some of the people on the head of Poly, you know, the things that I get to talk about. Other people that uh, worked with me over the years. It's a great place to work at. They're really good people. They've been, and I actually have to thank Exxon Mobil. We make a lot of fun of them sometimes, even those of us that work there. <laughs> But they've been very good in supporting our work and accepting some of us that maybe are not exactly the, the, the optimum cultural icons of the corporate environment. So they've been, they've actually been very good and, and so I thank them as well. And thanks for your attention. And is how do we control the pore size distribution on nebula? So you can see nebula is some powder, bulk, bulk material that has to be formulated. So it's, it's largely in that formulation process that that occurs. Okay. But um, we haven't had any problems. We've been able to adjust, make some adjustments in the pore size. And uh, if you start getting to maybe resin molecules, there's some issues. But we think all the way up through VGOs, what we have is not a problem as far as pore size goes. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So I, I, uh, I, I guess uh, if you could say something about it in, in terms of uh, per unit amount of molybdenum, 
in the nebula compared to the, the more conventional, like uh, uh, the Akatos uh, scale by A48. What, what is the relative activity per unit volume volume? I know you don't have the support here, the other ones are supporting. The yeah, so your question, your question is, you know, what's the relative activity per unit of molybdenum? So personally, I think the real question is, it's not necessarily per unit of molybdenum, right. but per, per unit of, of, of active site. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have more, more sites or do we have more active sites right. Right. is a question. And that's a good question, one that we've been asking ourselves for many years. And I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the side now of actually in the nebula that we have, we have actually more active sites as opposed to more number of sites. Okay, but I can't go into it any more than that. <laughs> okay. There's uh, one more question. Um, I've been looking at this system for a long time in copper zinc oxide aluminum. I mean, the the better synthesis catalysts are really high for calcites ultimately. And the issue that you always run into is the thermal stability problem because those bruce like layers like to collapse. So the structure you've created here theoretically should have better thermal stability and potentially be able to function in that copper zinc or zinc oxide aluminum system. Have you, have you ever looked at anything like that? Because you could technically get rid of the molybdenum out and you take that structure and turn it back into another right now, so I presume. Or is it? No, no, no. The molybdenum, the molybdenum stayed there. I mean, that, that, that actually is, that's gone. Okay, <laughs> uh, no, the molybdenum, it was an ammonium nickel molybdenum oxide yeah. phase that we made, yeah. which then you could convert. So it's, it's locked into the crystal. Yes, it's you, locked into the crystal. You could just unreactive. No, you, I, you, this, this sort of uh, sort of memory effect that you have with high calcites where yeah, they, exactly. they can go back to the oxide. Yeah, that does, once you get the molecule, yeah, that's gone. It's gone. Yeah. yeah. But we didn't look at these kind of phases for out of those Thank you very much. Okay. Join me again for that, you